And I want to let you know today it's going to take faith. It's going to take faith to believe what you're about to see and what you're about to hear. The good news about that is, is that the word of God promises that all of us have been given a gift of faith, a measure of faith. So we need faith to believe, to see it, so that we can say it, seize it, share it. But the first gift that God ever gave to anyone is faith. He's brilliant. He knew we would need faith to believe, so he gave it to us already. And all it takes is that spark and then the Holy Spirit to fan it into flame. And the next thing you know, you're walking out of here better, better, and stronger and stronger. You ready for that? Faith. It takes faith to get past the first three words of the Bible. In the beginning. That takes faith. It takes faith to get past the first two words of the most famous scripture, John 3, 16, for God. I have to have faith to believe in God. Are you listening now? And we're living in a time, a perilous time, where faith is fleeting and opinions are dominating. For the first time in our nation's history, we are post-Christian. Less people confessing Christ as their Savior than more. Now you can panic about that or you can get motivated and do something about it. For I have called you, Jesus said, to be like a city set on the side of the hill that cannot be hid. Like a lamp not placed under the basket but be placed on top of the basket for all to see. In other words, when we see the times we are facing, we can either cower in fear or we can get filled up in faith and shine brighter than we've ever shown in our entire life and be light to darkness, be hope to despair, be love to hate. But going back to opinions, we're living in this season where it seems like everybody's got one. I've got an, anal- I've got an analogy for you today. It's just my little brainchild I've been working on in my mind. I think that opinions are much like belly buttons. We all have one. Some are more hidden than others. Some stand out a little more a little more than others. Some at times can be a little fuzzy. We're talking opinions now. They're like belly buttons. And just I so bad should not say this last one, but I can't help myself. And some, well, they just think to high heaven. (laughs) Opinions are like belly buttons because everybody's got one. And they're all different. So what do we do when we're faced in a time in a society where everybody is casting out their truth? Your truth is your truth, but my truth is my truth. Your way is your way, but my way is my way. Are you listening now? You live your life, I'll live mine. What is life? There's so many questions that are being thrown out, so many thoughts that are being challenged. And I think it is a beautiful opportunity for us to arise as light to darkness. Us to stand out. Because Jesus said, I am the light of the world, but I have called you to be the light in the world. And so we're going to look at something today that we could see by faith Jesus set us up perfectly for. And the challenge that we have as a whole is, well, religion hasn't surely helped us up to this point. And so a lot of people are tuning out of the message, of the truth, of the gospel. Because religion has tainted it. Because religion never came from God. It came from man. And the little bit that we do know is anything that mankind gets their hands on without God, we typically mess it all up. And we leave it more broken than it was in its original state. So we have a challenge because religion has painted this hellfire, brimstone, turn or burn, all of these different things, this you have to do these 13 things just right, 
If you do one wrong, you got to go back to the beginning, start all over again. And religion has painted this picture to the world that it's hard. It's hard. You got to work hard. You got to you got to give everything you've got to believe in God. And that's just not true. Jesus said faith as small as a mustard seed. Tiny itty bitty faith with no doubt can do the impossible. So sometimes it's not about going and getting more faith. It's just simply about getting doubt out. And that's what today's message is all about. Because here's the principle I want you to grab a hold of today. Is you can spend all your time and your energy on cursing the darkness. Or you can simply turn the light on. Are you listening now? If I spend everything that I have cursing the darkness, well, I don't like the way our society's going, and I don't like the way politics are going, and I don't like the laws that are, if I spend all of my energy on that, then I'm missing out on the beauty of the, of the latter part, and that is simply turning the light on, because here's why. The light pierces the darkness, and the darkness cannot comprehend it, and the darkness must flee. In the presence of light. So I can do both by simply doing the latter. If I just turn the light on, the darkness is cursed in itself. It has to go. It can't stand to be around me. It won't be able to be in your presence because you are the light in the world, carrying the light of the world, burning bright on the inside of you. And everywhere you go, you take that light with you and you carry it into every circumstance. Every situation. And all of a sudden, that light starts to chase the darkness out. I'm going to come back to this in just a minute, but I want to jump in to what we're talking about today. And Jesus said it best in John 14, verse 6. What do we do in times like this? What do we do when our faith is being tested? What do we do when our morals are being tested? What do we do when everything around us seems to be in utter chaos? What do we do when people say your truth is your truth, my truth is my truth, and it really doesn't matter? No, it does matter because Jesus said, I am the way. It's like the Ohio State University. There's only one, the Ohio State University. There are others, but they are the. <laughs> I'm frustrating some people today. I'm just, just having a little bit of fun. I'm a Texan now. But I still got a Buckeye burning in my heart. Some of you go, well, what's a Buckeye? Uh, it's a little nut looking thing. It's really it's kind of weird, but you should see her mascot. It's kind of crazy and nutty. But anyway, so Jesus said, I am. We could just stop right there. When he said to the Pharisees, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, all of them talked about the I am. And then he said, I am the I am. I am. I am the way. I am the the truth, and I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. What I want to do today is I want to break down all three of those parts. And we're going to get the what, which is really kind of the who, and they combine together, and then we're going to look at the why. Why this is important to our lives. I believe in the why because the why adds value. And I believe the call of God on all of our lives is to add value to other people. I don't want to be in a relationship where I'm not able to add value. I don't want to be in a partnership where I can't add value. There's times where God calls us to walk through a season where somebody with us isn't really adding value to us. They're subtracting value. But you got to know when that season comes to an end and when it doesn't. I can't control what someone else does, but I surely can control what I do. I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. So we're going to look at this, and a very fancy term we use in theology is called hermeneutics. And what hermeneutics is, is it's 
backing scripture up with scripture, proving scripture with more scripture. And here's why. Because Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will remain. The world is trying to destroy the word of God over and over again. It's still standing. 66 books written by 44 authors spanning over thousands of years, standing the test of time. Perfectly intricate, one fitting into the other, one building the other, the other complementing the one that built it and affirming that it was true. All of it is here's wise because it's Jesus. So we're going to break it down and we're going to look at the way. What does it mean when he says, I am the way. Well, it gets really simple when we look at it like this in John 10 verse 9. He said, I am the gate. Who? He didn't say, I'm the gatekeeper. I am the literal gate. Some translation says, I am the door. Like I'm not the door man. I'm not the bellhop. I'm not the valet. I'm the door itself. I am the gate. Those who come in through me will be saved. There's a good why right there. They will come and they will go freely. And they will find good pastures. You know what he's telling us in modern day vernacular? When you come into me, you'll find freedom. It's the second part of our vision statement. You'll find freedom and you'll live a good life. So often we feel like, that old religious thing, like we need to get our own cat of nine tails and whip ourselves a few times because we're such a bad little boy and bad little girl. No, even when we are unfaithful, he is still faithful for he cannot deny himself. He's for you. He's not against you. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. When you sign up and say yes with Jesus, you're on the Jesus team, period, until the day you say you no longer want to be on the team. You could drop the ball. You could miss a block. You can get sacked. You could fumble. You could throw an interception. Doesn't make a difference. God, he's in. He's for you. He's never leaving you. He's never forsaking you. He will be with you always is what the scripture says. So when the world is chaotic and so much craziness seems to be happening around us, we find assurance, rested assurance in the way. I just got to get focused back on the gate. Fix my eyes on Jesus, the champion of my faith. He is the way. Here's the why behind it. Acts 4.12, there is salvation in no one else. Like, you're out of options. Why is there salvation to no one else? Because no one else was willing to pay the price that Jesus paid. And no one else was able to do it. All God, all man, left the throne in heaven to come down and inhabit a human form. Not to be celebrated, barely to be tolerated, then to be humiliated, all for you. And that's why God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. There's the why. We must be saved. Saved from what? Saved from our own selves. Saved from the fear that is in the world. Saved from the pain of our past, the guilt and the shame that we can leave behind us. Saved from an eternity that was never designed for us, but be able to walk into heaven with our heads held proud. And hear those words, well done, my good and my faithful servant. That's the why. That's why he's the gate. Because he paid the price that no one else could pay and no one else would pay so that we must be saved. Are you listening now? And then he goes on and says, I am the truth. Well, now things start to get settled a little bit. Because your truth isn't necessarily truth. He's truth. Truth isn't a what, truth is a who. Jesus is truth. Not only is he truth, he is the truth. 
He is. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. Do you know that in heaven Jesus isn't called Jesus? I don't want to freak you out. But in Revelation it says what his name is when he sits upon his white horse, eyes full of fire, feet like bronze. Upon his head are many crowns. And his name is written across his chest, the word of God. Jesus is the word and the word is Jesus. So when I don't know what to believe anymore because so many voices and so many things are being said and I read this and I heard that and they said this and they're pressuring me at school to believe. No, 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 no. I know the truth because I know him and he is truth. And that's where he takes us to John 1.14 and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only son from the father. And then look what he was full of. He wasn't full of what some of us are full of sometimes. Look what he was full of. Where'd your mind go? Come back here. He was full of both grace and truth. It's the perfect combination because grace covers you when you need covered the most. But then God cares about you. And he knows he can only cover you for a certain season. And then that covering will then become an inhibitor to what you're dealing with. And it's time to expose the truth. But then the beauty is he's only exposing the truth so he can cover you in grace all over again. His grace is sufficient for me. Even in my weakness... His grace is sufficient for me. Truth and grace abounding at the same time. They seem to be diametrically opposed to one another. One covers and one exposes. And do you know that whenever he reveals, it's only his intent to do it because he heals. He's not revealing something in your life to humiliate you. He's revealing something in your life to heal you. And sometimes we can't see it. And it doesn't mean it's everyone else's job to point it out. Sometimes, and we all should have people in our life that can speak into our life. I have a pastor. I talk to him literally at least once a month. I have other pastors, men and women of God who Speaking of my life, spiritual father, some in this house. I have a board of trustees that, that I, I glean from and I learn from. Always looking and asking if you see something. Our team, our, our pastor team, telling them. Our staff, telling them. Whether you are serving God in this house through facilities to the youth department, doesn't matter. If you see me off, say it. If I refuse to listen, something's deeper wrong with me. And if you're wrong, oh, you better watch out. <laughs> you better be right. But sometimes we don't see it because it's in our blind spot. You ever been driving down the road and you go to get over and somebody's in that lane that you just simply did not see? I was doing that. Two days ago on my motorcycle down 1431, as I watched this Mercedes SUV, if you're here, I love you, start to literally come over into my lane, she, she didn't see me. And she's a wonderful lady that was in a much more mature season of life than I'm in. You like that? I picked that up two weeks ago. Deposited that. Knew it would come around. She was more advanced in wisdom than I am. But I was in her blind spot. I was driving down 1431 at about 55 miles an hour, and she just started to come over to my lane. There was a semi-truck behind me and a car. Two, I couldn't speed up to get past her, and I couldn't slow down her. I was going to get wiped out. So I did the only conventional thing, and I blew my horn. And I got a real bike that doesn't go beep. It goes I'm just teasing. If you got a bike that goes beep, it's okay. 
your bike will get to a more mature season at some point. <laughs> but I blew my horn, and she swerved all over the place and then still cut me off anyway, and then started yelling at me, throwing her hands all up in the air. We came to a, a stoplight, and she's barking at me in the rearview mirror, pointing at me, and I'm like, this ain't my fault. But isn't that how we all are? When something surprises us that we didn't see coming and our blind spots exposed and our first reaction is to blame someone else? We have to get deep in there. We always must first look within before we look out. How can I be better? How can I be stronger? I want the truth. And here's why. John 8, 32, and you will know the truth and the truth will, it's a promise from God, it will set you free. Jesus already paid for the freedom on the cross. Our second statement is find freedom. Freedom's not lost. We're not asking you to go out and try to track it down. Freedom was actually already paid for. Your freedom isn't waiting on you to find it. Your freedom is already here waiting on you to discover that you need it. And when you get set free from the truth, he who the Son sets free is free indeed. So what we want to do to the best of our ability in this life, none of us are perfect. We're not. I'm not. You're not. And if you're looking for the perfect church, you mess it up since you walked in here today. So get over it. Right? We're all a work in progress from glory to glory. Now, we don't want to look like this. Highs and low, we want it glory to glory, sometimes oh, 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 glory, right? We all want to get better. We all want to get stronger. But the only way to do that is to be honest with ourselves. And the number one mirror for you to look in is not your side mirror, even if you've got all the little gadgets that blink and your seat shakes and stuff. No, no, the word of God. It is the mirror to your spirit, your soul, and your body. God will give you his opinion about you. He'll tell you that you're beautifully and wonderfully made. When people are mocking you, trying to humiliate you, then you get to hear what God sees in you. You'll hear that God has plans to prosper you. You'll hear that God is for you. He's not against you. And if God is for you, then who can stand against you? You'll hear that you were created on purpose and for a purpose. You'll see it. You'll see it. You'll hear it. You'll be able to receive it. And it'll increase your faith and chase doubt out. When you get to see God's opinion about you, about your situation, about your circumstance, we all need that truth. When you read the Bible, it doesn't feel like, oh, man, I'm really terrible. And this is just showing me I'm terrible. No, it's like, oh. I could be better. That's the difference between condemnation and conviction. Condemnation imprisons you in guilt and shame and pain. Conviction motivates you to be better, to be stronger, to keep moving forward. Are you all with me? Last one, and that is the life. He is the life. And this is what it looks like. John eleven twenty five. 25, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the life within your being. I am the life that breathed you into existence. I am the life. I am the wind in your sails. I'm the one who picks you up, brushes you off, gets you back on your path again. Whoever believes in me, though they die naturally, yet they shall live eternally. This is the life. This is the life that Jesus has called us to. We're going to see it that it's not just about the supernatural life to come in eternity, but it's about living a life full of abundance and overflow and enjoying the life that he has given us in our time on earth as well. Let's look at some wise. John 5, 24, truly, truly, I say to you. Anytime Jesus repeats himself like truly, truly, we should pay attention. He's like really trying to gain your attention. He's not a man that he would lie. 
He doesn't cast shifting shadows. Let your yea be yea, your nay be nay. So when he does repeat himself, he really is emphasizing something. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever, whoever, well, that's you, that's me, that's your neighbor, that's your lost co-workers, friend at school, that's whoever, hears my word and believes. Him who has sent me has eternal life. This is a big why. Our life is like a vapor. Here one second, gone the next. This life is temporal, it's fleeting. It'll be over in a short period of time in the span of eternity. And we have eternity to look forward to with Jesus. They do not come into judgment, but have passed from death to life eternally. That's a big why. Can I give you just one more bonus why? I got just a, two minutes left. Jesus said in John 10, 10, the thief has come, Satan, only to steal, kill, and destroy. Now, if we want to curse the darkness, we could say that scripture like, the thief has come only to steal, kill, and destroy. I curse that thief. I curse him stealing from me. I curse him killing my dream. I curse him destroying my life. Or you could simply turn the light on like Jesus did. He said, but I have come. See, I don't think he said it like the thief. I think he said, hey, the thief, Satan, he's only come to steal, to kill and destroy. But I have come to give you life. And life abundantly, life overflowing. I've come to bring you joy. I've come to bring you love. I've come to bring you peace. I've come to bring you patience. I've come to show you a better way for both eternity and here in this life. You don't have to suffer every moment of the day and be miserable to be a Christian. My life, after saying yes to Jesus at 23, just right before 24 years of age, and I tried a lot up to that moment, and nothing filled me, not permanently. It satisfied me for a short season. When that season was over, I was more empty than I, than I was when I began that journey. But since I said yes to Jesus, I love life. I look forward to tomorrow. I'm thankful for today. I can't wait to see my grandchildren grow up. I can't wait to see things happen in our church family in this city. I can't wait to see a city one for Jesus. I, I, I'm excited about it because Jesus is the life giver, and when I'm in him and he's in me, I have the same life that he has promised, both eternal and here on earth. That's the promise of Jesus. Do you believe it? Can we give Jesus one big thank you for his word?